Lord, I pray that what I say this morning may be inspired by your spirit and informed by your word. Amen. Matthew 5, starting from the Beatitudes, is amongst the most challenging of Jesus' teaching, and I want to deal with a section of it this morning. Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 to 48. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, praise for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the just as well as the unjust. If you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Don't even the tax collectors do the same. And if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Not even the, even the tax collectors do that. Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Nobody would disagree with love your friends and hate your enemies. It's the basis of how most people behave. It's the basis of political life. You favour your friends over your enemies. You love your enemies, sorry, you hate your enemies and you love your friends. But Jesus here claims that as believers in him, those who claim to be basing our life on the presence of his spirit and Jesus being on the throne of our lives, for us we must go more than that, we must go further. We must be perfect or complete as our Father is complete. As well as loving our friends or even loving our, our neighbours, those around us, we must also love our enemies. If someone curses us, we should bless them. If they hate us, we should do good to them. If they persecute us, we should not respond. That is what makes us truly like Jesus as his children. I mean, after all, how did Jesus respond to our rebellion against the Father, our sinfulness, our rejection of God at the fall? How did Jesus respond? By wiping us all out? No, by coming to die on a cross to pay the penalty for our sins and then to raise again from the dead triumphant over sin and death that's how jesus did it so if we're his followers we should go about doing it the same way the way to respond to enemies is not by hating them by actually making sacrifices on their behalf to go the extra mile and that is a real challenge for us Otherwise, what reward do we have? The tax collectors were the people at the time who no one liked. Why? Because supported by Roman military, they would always take more in commission than they were entitled to. And if you didn't pay on time, the soldiers would either trash your house or burn it down or trash or burn you. But even tax collectors loved other tax collectors. After all, they were supporting each other in the same enterprise. We should even love the tax collectors. Those who we naturally are threatened by. Those who naturally persecute us. Those who naturally discriminate against us. Those who are in the natural problematic we should love them. Even the world loves its neighbour, if only for the sake of peace. Even the world loves its friends. We must go one better. We must love our enemies. That makes us complete. It makes us more like Jesus. It goes beyond the threshold. It walks the extra mile. Didn't Jesus say, look, if a Roman soldier, one of the occupying army, asks you to take his pack one mile, go take it further. Go further than that. The story is very much echoed 
in the book of Jonah. I think the beginning of Jonah's book is much better known at the end. How Jonah is called to go and minister to Nineveh. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, cry out against it because its wickedness has come towards me. Preach to Nineveh. The big pagan power which is soon going to conquer you, trash your people and throw them into exile. Go preach to Assyria. Say to them that God wants to be merciful to you. It, it's almost like a Jewish person in 1936 going to Nazi Berlin and saying, God wants to be good to you. He wants you to be good to them instead of promising judgment. Say, why don't you turn back to God so that God loves you? I'm willing to sacrifice for you myself. What kind of Jewish person would go to Berlin in 1936 in order to preach that that city turned back to God and doesn't go the way of evil? A very sacrificial one. I suppose if I was a Jew living in 1936, I would rather ask any city to repent other than Berlin. Oh, send me to London or New York or anywhere else, not Berlin. And yet Jonah is called to Berlin. He's called to his equivalent of Berlin. He's called to Nineveh. What does he do? As I think is generally known, he flees the other way. He goes to Tarkish. He goes then down the sea to Joppa the, and takes a boat all the way to Tarkish, as far away from Assyria as possible. Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, is to the northeast and Tarkish is to the southwest. He pays the fare. He tries to escape. He tries to disappear from the commission of preaching to the nation of his enemies. What happens then? Well, as is generally known, the one thing about the book of Jonah that people know if they know anything about the book of Jonah is that there is trouble with the boat. Jonah odds up that it's probably something to do with him after they cast lots and the lot falls on Jonah. What is the trouble? What's your occupation? Where do you come from? Why? Are you the cause of our trouble? The fact that our boat might be going down. Jonah says, I am a Hebrew. I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This makes the people afraid. Well, his God, he claims his God owns the sea we're going to be thrown into. How can we resolve the trouble? Well, Basically, Jonah and the crew resolve that Jonah be thrown into the water. Pick me up, throw me into the sea, and then the sea will become calm. They pray as they throw him in. Do not let us perish for this man's life. Do not charge us with this innocent blood. They pick him up and they throw him into the sea. And as soon as, G as Jonah hits the waves, the storm calms, just like when Jesus entered the fishing boat in Galilee. The storm stopped and the disciples were safe, just like this when Jonah is thrown into the water. The waters calm and the crew and the people in the boat are then safe. What then happens? He's swallowed by a whale. And guess where the whale of the Lord turns him back to? Guess where he's thrown off? Near Nineveh. And the Lord says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach the message that I tell you. You've opted out the first time, I'm giving you a second chance. Preach to your enemies. Hope that they turn back to me rather than are thrown into the sea. Preach to Nineveh. A three-day journey from one side to the other. 
Jonah goes to Nineveh. He obviously can't go away. He's a bit of a reluctant preacher. He enters Nineveh and he cries out, yet for 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Repent of your evil or in 40 days you will be overthrown. And maybe Jonah thinks at that point, well, if I preach that they need to repent and turn from the evil, at least I've done my job. And in 40 days there'll be no more and I can wash my hands with them and go home. But life doesn't happen like that. The people of Nineveh believe in God. They proclaim a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least. And the word comes to the king of Nineveh and he lays across his throne and lays aside his robe and covers himself with sackcloth and clicks in a, and sits in ashes. And he has it proclaimed. Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let man and beast be covered in sackcloth and cry to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from violence in his hand. Who can tell if God can turn and relent and turn away his fierce anger so that we may not perish? And Nineveh repents. And it says in verse 10 that God sees their works, they turn from the evil way, and God relents from the disaster. But what is Jonah's response to the positive reception of his message of repentance? Is he delighted that destruction hasn't come upon the city of the enemies? No, he's exceedingly displeased. He says, I fled to Tarkish for I knew that you were a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abandoned in loving kindness. Please take my life from me. I'd rather die than live. I'm miserable that these people have repented and saved themselves from justice. I hated them. I hate these people so more that rather than find mercy in you, I wish that they were judged and wiped out. Jonah stomps out the city, finds himself a shelter, which God augments into a shame. It's better for me to die than to live. God says to Jonah, is it right that you are angry with this plane? You have had pity on the plant which you have not laboured, nor made it grow look at things in context you've been kind to this little plant but within Nineveh the great city there are 120,000 persons who cannot discern from their right and their left hand and if you don't care for the people at least there is the livestock why are you so qualified with your mercy I can show mercy to you and your lot it's okay I can show mercy even to a plant and it's okay, but I can't show mercy to your enemies. What's wrong with you? Jonah needed to learn the message of Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Even when we're doing the right thing, those who discriminate against us or give us a hard time or persecute us, especially before, because we are Christians, rather than be wiped out in judgment, it's actually God's will that they turn back and repent and avoid judgment. Rather than our enemies be judged, the Lord would rather that they turn back and repent so they would turn from enemies into being both his friends and our friends. It is not right, it is not loving, it is not Christ-like con to continue vendettas. To say, well, I am nice to my friends, I don't have to be nice to my enemies. God invites us through Jesus' teaching in Matthew 5 to go above that ceiling, above that low parapet, 
We are to love our enemies as well as our friends. It's actually our Christian duty. And rather than do it reluctantly, let's do it joyfully, hoping that they may repent. As I'm sure I've told you before, my mother's family came from Italy, from Trieste, escaping Mussolini and going to Acton. And as a Jew today, I'm very aware of the Holocaust, even though it was 75 years ago. I'm aware of it. The Nazis were our enemies, if anyone has an enemy. Maybe because of that, I could be tempted to hate Germans today. And I remember when I was a kid, my father and I wanting me to study German at school, but because of her experience of escaping the Nazi Holocaust, my mother was adamant that I never learned German at school. Don't you dare learn Nazi learn Hitler's language, learn French instead. And that bitterness could continue within me. For me, actually, the bitterness hasn't been against Germans. After all, I'm aware of the fact that since World War II, the Germans have actually repented of their crimes and they actually pay Israel reparations. Germany together with Italy are ironically the two, the two European nations with the best historical record of supporting Israel in the United Nations. I've always had a problem with Turks. Why Turks? I've always excused myself from loving Turks as I love other people. I think I said in a previous church service here that I would never go to a Turkish kebab shop or buy a doner kebab from a Turkish person, quite apart from the meat being halal. Why have I got something against Turks? Well, it's like this. My father's family did not escape the Nazi Holocaust. My father's family are the only Jewish refugees I know in Europe who came here escaping a holocaust intended for somebody else. We're Armenian-speaking Jews from Armenia. A third of it was part of the Turkish Empire. The Turks persecuted the Armenians. In 1905, they nearly slaughtered them. It was a dress rehearsal. In 1917, during World War I, the Turks massacred one million of the of Turkey's three, uh, uh, one million of the world's three million Armenians. One world Armenian in three was slaughtered in the Armenian genocide by the Turkish army. And even today, the Turkish nation, the Turkish army that did it, Turkish politicians are in complete denial of that historical fact. They've not repented. They've not even acknowledged it. My family escaped penniless from Armenia, just in case, as Armenian-speaking Jews, some Turkish soldier mistook them for proper Armenians and shot them. That's how we became penniless refugees. Well, I'm actually quite pleased in a way that my father and mother's family both escaped Holocaust in order to get to um, West London. Otherwise, I suppose I wouldn't have been born. And I'm glad that I was born, but... I've always had a problem with the Turkish denial of the Holocaust, which I haven't with the Germans. You see, I think it's easier to forgive someone who acknowledges their crime and comes to terms with it. But then the other day, I was walking with Mary and a friend of ours who was visiting us. And it had been a nice day, but it started to rain. And we went inside and we were looking for a coffee shop with a proper shelter. And the only place with a proper shelter was a Turkish shop. And before I could object, our friend Frida and Mary were sitting there. And we ordered some food. And the food was lovely, although for some reason they didn't have hot drinks in, on the menu. So we had to order cold drinks. 
and he was too it was too cold for Mary to drink her cold drink. So I went in at the end of the meal in order to pay. And I was adamant, I don't want to pay for the cold drink that Mary didn't drink. They said to me, well, you have to pay for it because once you've touched it due to COVID regulations, we can't sell it to another customer. So I paid the bill. I thought that they charged us for the cold water, the, you know, the fizzy water drink. And I marched off with it and I offered to pay. And when I went home, I checked the receipt. And guess what? They hadn't charged us for the water after all. I had accidentally shoplisted a bottle of fizzy water. I'd stolen it. I'd taken it without paying. What did I do? I thought, well, maybe they'll send the police after me. Maybe there's CCTV. What do I do? I'll go back to the shop and I'll offer to pay. So the next day I went back and offered to pay the difference. There was the waiter. He said to me, thank you for being honest with your mistake. The bottle is yours. I can't resell it. Take it as a free gift. Go on your own way. God bless you. How did that make me feel? Came to terms with the fact that he was loving me more than I was loving him. He was actually behaving more like a Christian than I was behaving like a Christian. It really challenged me and it really mortified me. And I thought to myself, well, when it comes to loving your enemies, not only must that exclude Germans, the descendants of the Nazis, it ought to exclude Turks as well. I actually owe a Turkish restaurant in Brentford one. We should love our historical enemies as well as our historical friends. Vendettas are never a good thing to have. It's better to clear the records, even if you do it unilaterally. As well as the Nazi Holocaust and the Armenian Genocide, another atrocity I was brought up being aware of was the Irish potato famine. I might have shared before with many of you that I was brought up in County Kilburn when it was heavily Irish Catholic. And I knew people who were sympathizers of Sinn Féin as a child and later on as I got involved in Jewish ministry and I got to know people from the unionist community as well through working for a mission that had lots of uh, deputation in free Presbyterian churches. And uh, I had one bizarre trip to Northern Ireland where due to friends of my childhood and friends from my missionary present, I managed to have a drink with uh, Jerry Adams and a tea with Ian Paisley on the same trip. And they, because I had social links with both sides, I was used as an envoy with the Good Friday Agreement. The Good Friday Agreement was basically about two sides that hated each other. Neither side could win the war. Neither side could afford to lose. So basically it was trying to negotiate a draw. And I was so pleased to get involved because I seem to uniquely know friends from both sides and know that both sides over the centuries had done great atrocities to the other one, which I won't go into now. But I will tell you that the atrocities in Northern Ireland are two-sided. Don't believe in the atrocities of one camp without believing in the atrocities of the other. They're both equally true, in fact. But the only hope for Northern Ireland, actually, is not whoever forms the government but that both sides make their nominal Christianity real. That they clear the records. That they finish the vendetta. That they decide to love rather than hate their enemies. 
if they love their enemies rather than hate them, both sides would stumble into a unique political solution, a solution from Jesus, one with boundaries that could not be mapped before. And I think going back to Matthew 5, the challenge for us is to clear vendettas. They do no use. They just continue and continue and get deeper and deeper and longer and longer and wider and wider. If you continue to hate your enemies, you just make it worse with the, your successors and your descendants. Someone needs to break the pattern. Jesus broke the pattern of our alienation from God by actually dying for his, his enemies, which is all of us. He came, he died on a cross in order to pay for our sins, and then he rose again, triumphant over sin and death. Jesus is not telling us in Matthew 5 to do anything that he hasn't done himself. Brothers, if we are really brothers, we need to go beyond loving our friends. We need to love our enemies. We need to cancel the debt, even if they're not willing to acknowledge or repay it. We need to be more Christ-like. And I know it is a big challenge. And I think that unless Jesus is on the throne of our life and we're truly motivated by the Holy Spirit in what we do, I think it is beyond us. Lord, I pray that we may accept your challenge to love our enemies. And I pray that it may even change who we are. And I pray it may bring your peace into the world in which we live and i pray it may dissolve hatred and create the environment where people can turn to you maybe be examples of you building the kingdom amen thanks for inviting me <laughs>